Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night at Covenant. We're so glad that you chose to be in worship with us on this evening. Uh, just a couple of things. I want to remind you that the choir is off for the next month, so there will not be choir rehearsal on tomorrow night. I do want to remind you that Glenn's reading room is coming up uh, this Saturday. This Saturday. Uh, where is she at? Is she in here? Judy Hand Truitt? Oh, she's not in here. Well, you can see him and he'll get the word to him. <laughs> but anyway, also coming up on this, um, uh, this Sunday uh, after service, the New Connections group is going to be meeting for the first time. It's the Young Adult Connections group, the 20 or somethings, and it's going to be immediately after the church in the education hall, I understand. Also, I uh, want to remind you that uh, Camp Meeting is coming up next month. So be mindful, there's Judy Andrew right there. And uh, if you want to know how to get there, she can be glad to tell you how to get there. Uh, so uh, to, to uh, Glenn's reading room, that is. And so we want to remind you that camp meeting is coming up. It's going to be in Huntsville. We'll have addresses and all those things. Dinner will be out, dinner on the grounds is at 5 o'clock. And then the service is at, 7 at 6.30, I think. And uh, we will be uh, tag team, Richard and I will be tag team preaching for that event. And so we want you to uh, make plans to be there. And also, if you, uh, we want to just say to you, uh, if you're leaving this weekend on, on a holiday trip, please be careful. Uh, it, it, you, we wish you a very happy and safe coming up holiday week. Amen? There is no dinner and, and, and uh, no worship next Wednesday. We always take off the 4th of July week as well. So, uh, because a lot of people go out of town, a lot of people have all kind of things that they're planning for during that week. So next week, we will not be having uh, Wednesday night services, but we will return on the 9th. And so, uh, just be mindful of that, okay? If you love the Lord, say Amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you love the Lord, please stand on your feet and let's worship. Hello. Okay. Now I have the big...
Sometimes I don't think we really understand this song. If we really understood this song, y'all all would be Pentecostals. <laughs> you couldn't stop you from jumping the pews and running out if you really understood how great his love really is. Not dependent on what you did yesterday or what you'll do tomorrow. It's not dependent on you at all. This is something he has decided. God said, I'm going to love you. It doesn't matter what you think about it. And if we got that kind of love, that's a good God. Do you know why you, do you know why you're sustained by that love? And this is the part we don't get because We've been taught all of our lives what you do come back at you. And God says, not with me. My grace will never allow you to go anywhere or do anything that I can't reach you. And that's why his love is so high. It ain't like the love that we grew up knowing. It's a greater love than that. Think about his love.
Uh, there's nothing God can't do for us. From the cares that fret, the burdens that weary, the noises that distract us, every one of them, God can handle. And so at the beginning of the service on Wednesday night, we'd like to invite you, if you have something you're struggling with, a burden that maybe needs to be lifted, maybe something you just need to take it to the Lord and leave it there, we invite you to come around the altar for a moment of prayer. And as we lift them, know that you're on holy ground, that there are angels hovering all around you. Your great cloud of witnesses are watching over you, cheering you on, and those angels are there to protect you. Would you come as we sing? Oh, we You are there or by the airways. We're lifting whatever it is that is burdening us down. Whatever has got us bent over, whatever has got us disturbed, Lord, we know that we can trust it into your care, that you, we can leave it with you, and you are able to handle it. And so, God, we know tonight that your grace will not allow us to go anywhere that you cannot reach us. And so tonight, God, whatever it is that these your people need, I pray that the windows of heaven would open and you will pour out blessings on them that they don't even have room to receive, that they will know that they know that they know when they leave this place that you are God and that you love them, that you care for them, that you forgive them, that you accept them, and that there's nothing that's going on in their life that's greater than your love and greater than your care and greater than your concern. And God, we know this because we stand on holy ground and your angels are hovering about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
know, one thing that I have learned in my faith walk is that once you know that you know that you know that God loves you without limit and condition, you just can't wait to share that information with other people. Um, you feel a burning desire inside to make sure that everybody knows how much God loves them. So I say that because recently we've been reviewing our internet broadcasts. Um, we live stream services on Wednesday and Sundays, and we also offer them on demand for people who want to watch them. And what I learned last night in the board meeting is that sometimes there are 500 people that watch our services on demand. 500 people watching a Sunday service. There might be a half a dozen people watching it live, but then there are hundreds of people that are watching us online. And I want you to understand that those people are learning how much God loves them because of you, because of your support of this church with your time and your talents and your offerings and tithes. So I want to thank you and help you understand what an impact you're making in this world. Would the ushers come forward? Do I have any ushers? Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share your love with other people. Lord, I ask that you bless these tithes and offerings and bless the givers. In Jesus' name, amen. In the midst of that little film clip, it talked about loving God with all your heart. And that's what we've been thinking about in talking about living with priority, how to love God with all of our heart. Tonight I want to pick up the series that I started a couple of weeks ago, uh, a week before Vacation Bible School, called Living with Priority. It's premised on what Jesus said was the most important commandment. Tom Holliday put it this way, he said, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. I believe that. I also believe it'll grow a great relationship with God. 
and it will grow a great relationship with your significant other. And I believe it will also grow a great life as well. Amen? Mark, the 12th chapter, 28 through 31st. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So what is the most important thing you can do in life? It's simply this, to love God. It all starts there, loving God. And what happens when you develop an all-out love for something or someone? We talked about this in the first session, and I'm not going to go over that again. If you want to get it, you can. I'm just going to hit it, but you can get the details of it by getting the copy of it, the transcript from uh, Joe in the office. But... When you got an all-out love for something, there's just some things that naturally happen. One of the things that it does is it occupies your waking thoughts. You know how it was when you first saw that some sweet somebody? You just couldn't stop thinking about it. That's what it is. And then it impacts your decisions, a majority of your decisions. You make your decisions based on it. And then it causes you to make lavish sacrifices. You do things for that person you wouldn't do for anybody else. Amen? Well, you need to be doing that for God as well. And it energizes your life. You know, some of you, <laughs> some of us look so dead walking around until we see somebody sweet. And all of a sudden, we got a little something in our step. <laughs> it energizes your life. And then it rearranges your priorities. You'll rearrange your priorities to make sure you have time for that person. Amen? If you love God with your all out heart, you need to rearrange something to make sure you have time for God. Amen? Because an all out love for the Lord will affect your heart, that's your feelings, it will affect your mind, that's your thoughts will affect your soul, that's your will, and it will affect your strength, that's our actions. And that's what we're talking about in living with priorities. Let us pray. God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you because your love is higher than the mountains and is deeper than the sea. And if we think about it, we can develop that all-out love for you that changes our lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen and amen. In that first session that we talked about, I shared with you how David uh, was a man after God's own heart. And it wasn't because he was so, so good. David was far from perfect. Amen? He was a liar, a deceiver, a murderer, and an adulterer. And that was just one scene in his life. And he, he, he goes on and on. But yet, the Bible tells us over and over again, this person who was, did all these things was a man after God's own heart. It says that he was the apple of God's eye. That term, the apple of God's eye, comes from the scripture. It comes from David. That he was the apple of God's eye. How can that be? How can this man be this person that God continually said, he's got the kind of heart that pleases me. He's the kind of person when I look at him, his heart is so full. What was it about David that made him have that kind of heart for God? Well, if you read through the Psalms, uh, that David wrote, and I remember David didn't write all of the Psalms, uh, but he wrote a, a great deal of them. You will find that he did a lot of things that made him like that. And in the last session, I told you this time I was going to share with you the top six things that David did. The six things that you and I can do in our lives to follow the example of David and then after I delved into, delved into it, um, this was not a shock to Jamie, uh, but 
I only got to one of them for this session <laughs> because there were so many things about this one that I needed to bring out. So I promise this is not going to be an odyssey. So next time, I'm going to try to share the other five. He doesn't think I can do that either, but I, I'm going I'm to make him a liar, okay? But this week, he's telling the truth. I'm only going to do the first of the six. If these six things that I'm going to talk about, if we try to incorporate them into our lives, we will find, we will discover that we have an all-out love for God. We will discover that we, like David, when God look at us, God will say, Jeanette's got a heart for God. Stephanie's got a heart for God. Jackie has got a heart for God. Jamie has got a heart for God. Maybe not you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jeremy's got a heart for God. If you do these things, even Bobby, God will even say this about Bobby. And he'll choke, but he'll say it. Amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And I will, get I will get retribution from sister over there shortly. But I don't care. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 28 and 9, that we are to serve him, serve God, with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches every heart and he understands every motive behind the thoughts. What this is really saying is you might as well serve God with wholehearted devotion because he already knows what's going on in your heart and your thoughts. You know, it's amazing to me you ought to sit in my office sometime. If you could be a fly on the wall sometime and, you, and, and, and the pastor has to dig through the, uh, um, let's say this nicely, the stuff uh, uh, you know, that people talk to me about and then you have to sort of break through it to them and tell them what's really going on, what you're really saying to me, you'd be surprised at how many people will sit in my office and think that they're telling me something that God doesn't know. Please understand. Really? But for some reason, I think they think if they haven't given voice to it before, God doesn't know about it. God already knows. Amen? God knows, he understands every motive and behind everything. You can't fool God. You can't fake God out. You can fake me out, but you can't fake God out. If you're going to serve God and love, do it with your whole heart. And that's what this is talking about, loving with your whole heart. And that number one thing that you need to do, since someone else's phone is going off, I'll make sure mine's off, uh, is what? Number one, talk to God aloud and with emotion. You know, God doesn't have a nervous condition. You don't have to lower your voice and whisper to God. Amen? Talk out loud. Talk. And when I talk, mean talk. I mean pray. I mean, I can think of the prayers. I can think of my prayers. But the example of David throughout the book of Psalms was when he wanted to, when he, when he got in trouble. He talked out loud to God. He talked to God with great emotion. Amen? Evidently, he was a Pentecostal. <laughs> he danced in the spirit, too, remember? He danced till his clothes come off, and Michael, his wife, chastised him. He said, honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. So, you know, you know uh, the choir used to sing this great song, song from um, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sang from Psalms 3, but thy, O God, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. But what comes right after that verse, in Psalms, in Psalms 3 and 4, uh, he says, To the Lord I cried aloud, and he answered me from his holy hill. Did you hear that? I cried aloud. Many times when we talk to God, we talk to God with the mute button on. Amen? I mean, you know what? When you hit the mute button on TV, you see the lips still moving, but you don't hear it. Now, it isn't that God doesn't know what's in your heart, 
But so many times we're not genuine. We've got the mute button. No, our lips are moving, but our hearts are not really praying. Let me tell you something. For me, you, you know, my neighbor came over yesterday when I was in the middle of prayer. <laughs> and I was at home, and he thought somebody was there. He said, I didn't mean to disturb you. It's because he heard me praying out loud. Oh, well. So I got a neighbor who thinks I'm crazy. Would I rather him think I'm crazy or not talk to God? Amen? Amen. You see, it's sort of like that when we talk to God. I, I would think God sometimes would say, can't you just say it? Can't you just get it out, what you're feeling? It's not that God can't, doesn't know, but God is trying to get you to receive. And there's power in the spoken word. Amen? There's power in that spoken word. And David had this quality of being able to tell God what was really happening in his heart. And because of that, God, Saul, was able to immediately impact David's heart. If you read through the psalm, you read through a psalm that David, you, don't, you can't just read the first few verses because you'll get a wrong impression. you got to read that whole psalm to get the whole picture. Because usually always at the beginning of the psalm, there's a problem that David is dealing with and David will, will just sound like he is a nut. I mean, really. He's just going off the deep end. But because he's praying it out loud, he's, saying that, he's talking to himself. You know how they tell you to talk a problem out? That's what David's doing with some of these songs. He, he puts out there and, and God impacts his heart and by the end of that psalm, you see, he's got to where he needs to be. Read those psalms sometimes. You'll see them like that. You know, you know and at, so at the beginning of Psalms 3, uh, this is a psalm about um, his own son, Absalom, who is out to take the throne from him. And he's got enemies on every side. And, 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 and he is just really fed up. And he says, but thou, O Lord, are shield for me, the glory and the lift of my head. And by then, he said, I cried out to the Lord, and I heard from his holy heel. And you see, he is so low at that moment, he's got to walk on stilts to look a snake in the eye. That's how low he is. At the, he's in such depression. And, and, and now he, and he works through it, and then at the end of it, he's praising God. Just a few lines of talking out loud, and life is changed for him. God has changed his heart. There's something therapeutic about saying it out loud. About just saying it. Just saying it the way you feel it. You know, so many times we think we got to impress God. One of the things that you can do by saying it out loud is you can really say it the way you feel it. Some of us think it's just not dignified to talk to God. God has heard everything. Amen? Amen. He doesn't have a nervous condition and he doesn't have tender ears. You're not going to surprise him with anything you say. Amen? Wouldn't it be great if your life could be changed just in a few lines? Wouldn't that be great? David shows us how to do it. Some of us have never really talked to God about our struggles or our difficulties in 20 or 30 years, much less a few verses. We're still suffering from that same emotion because we've never really told God how we feel. And you know what we say? Well, God knows my heart. <laughs> yes, it does. He knows you're hiding stuff in it too. And speaking it out has a way of breaking the dam, releasing the water of it, letting it flow. You know, a dam backs it up. If you dam something up, it backs the water up. And, and, and if you don't let it out, everything down the line, if you back it up in here, everything down the line <laughs> doesn't work right. You know, your physical body is built on a spiritual principle. You do know that, right? And what goes on in your body, it has a spiritual application to it. That may be a, a news to some of you, but it's true. And so, and so what you need to do is to be able to do what David said. God, here's what's happened in my life. Just say it, just spit it out, full force. 
Now, out loud don't mean you have to be real loud. I don't want you to get this sense that it's a matter, if, if you're not wired that way or designed that way, I don't mean change your personality. That's not what I'm trying to tell you, okay? God works through our personality. What I mean is give voice to it. When I say say it out loud, I mean give voice to it. If you just want to say, Lord, this is what's going on with me, God understands. The thing about it is speaking that word breaks the power of the secret behind whatever it is. Amen? Are you following me? Amen. By giving voice to it, you're tuning into God's presence. Some, try it sometime. I think you'll like it. You know, psychologists discovered something important years ago, and we all thought it was crazy when they tell us to do it. But they understood a principle, that's a spiritual principle. If you don't like yourself, stand in the mirror and tell yourself you like yourself. Say it to yourself. You'll laugh the first time it happens. It'll feel funny. But you say it enough times, and you'll begin to believe it. And it's because it's true. When people spoke evil to you and told you you were nothing, the reason you began to believe you're nothing is because you internalized it. You need to break that cycle. Speak it out loud. I am. You know, everybody wants to, you know, churches kill me with this, you know, preaching it. You know, the wages of sin is death. Yes, they are. But that's not the end of that verse. The verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Oh, all have come, sinned and come short of the glory. That's true. But that's not, there's no period at the end of that. There's a semicolon there. If it says, all have sinned but come short of the glory of God, but, but, God, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so if you begin to voice that, you, you got to break that cycle. Amen? And so, whether you're the quiet type or whether you are an extreme, mouthy person like Jeanette, <laughs> I just couldn't help it. I'm sorry. It works either way. If you learn to speak it, it works. And so tonight, the reason I couldn't get any further, I wanted to give you some. You know, it's too often preachers talk in spiritual terms and don't get real practical. I want to be real practical about this. I want to be as practical as I can about this. Uh, about how do I talk to God alive, aloud and with motions. Number one, what? to God about your feelings. Don't dress it up. Say exactly what you feel. Uh, Psalms 3 and 7. Arise, O Lord. Deliver me, O my God. Listen to what he said. Strike all my energy men is on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked. He's mad. David told God everything he felt. If it was in his heart, it came out of his mouth. That's a lot better than many of us. You remember the computer Hal? You remember that, computer, that movie the, with the computer Hal? Came, I think it came out in 2001, you know, and, um, and, and I think that's how we talk to God sometimes. You know, when they were trying to shut the computer down, Hal, the computer said, Dave, what are you doing, Dave? That's how we talk to God. What are you doing, God? Is that really how you feel? Is that really how you feel? Hey, that's not how I feel. In this calm voice. Our lives are messed up. We don't know where we're going to go. We don't know where we're going to turn. And we get to our prayers and we say, God, what are you doing, God? That's so stupid. Do you really talk to, if, if, you were, if you were talking to your friend about something that was going on that bad in your life, would you, say, would you say, Stephanie, do you realize how bad things are in my life, Stephanie? <laughs> no! Well, why do you talk to God like that? Remember, what, what did the scripture say? He understands every motive behind every thought. Amen? 
You know, yeah, I think God listened to him. He said, hmm, I'll get around to you when you really mean it. <laughs> Come back when you really want to talk to me. Obviously, you don't really want to talk to me. You know, share what's really going on in your heart. The, Bi the example in the Bible of this again and again is that people shared freely with God. In fact, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see it a lot. They just really shared their heart. They not only talked out loud to God through the Bible, but they got angry with God. When they felt the sense of hurt, they let God know it. Amen? Sometimes they even ripped their clothes off. I mean, I mean, that's just the way they were. That's just how they did it. You know, and, and, and they were serious about it. I'm not suggesting you do that today, but, but I'm saying that there's an emotion that, God, I need you. Where are you? Amen? Talk about your feelings. The second thing is what? Talk about your weaknesses. I love what Psalms 40, 17 says, I am poor and weak, and yet the Lord is thinking about me right now. That's an exclamation point. Okay? Oh my God, you are my helper. You are my savior. Come quickly and save me. Please don't delay. Does that sound like somebody who's just talking monotone to you? Tell God about your weaknesses. If you're thinking, I don't have any, then you need to talk to God about your lying. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I remember one time when I was facing the day when I was just feeling, you know, sometimes you feel the inadequacies of your life, and you know, something happens during the course of the day, you just feel inadequate uh, in your own life and stuff. And I, and, and I felt like, God, I don't know if I got the strength to continue to do this. This isn't working out the way I thought it was. Uh, when I, and it was when I was early on here, you know, now I can say this now, you wouldn't believe the boards I had to deal with when I first came here. You would, because you were around them. But, you know, I was miserable, and pretty soon, I found I was making other people miserable, too. And I said, uh-uh, this ain't going to continue. Y'all can do this without me. And I remember one day, in the middle of the day, I thought to myself, self, God didn't bring you here to be a little timid, shy person and to allow this nonsense to go on. And you don't have to, God didn't call you to be no doormat for nobody. I ain't no doormat. But you have to move in God's own time. And I, let me just tell you this. I wish I had a dime every time somebody thought they knew when God's time was for me to do something. I just wish I had a dime every time. Even members of the board and staff thought that I didn't move in the right time. Now, and sometimes they were right, but many times they were wrong. Amen? That's why you have to be at ease moving in your time. Amen? If you're going to talk to other people about it, why don't you try talking to God about it? I, people tell me their weaknesses, but they won't talk to God about their weaknesses. I can give you a few words of advice. He can actually change things. Why don't you t talk to God about your weakness? Number three. I'm trying to move on through this. Talk to God about what? Yes. You notice how you say your strengths? His strength. When was the last time you talked to God about strength? Maybe if you want to look at some really effective prayers in the Bible, go to the book of Acts and look at how the new Christians pray. They started off by telling God how great God was. <laughs> they started off by telling, reminding God what God had done in other situations. Then they would ask him to intervene in theirs. Talk to God about his strength. The tendency is that we have is we exaggerate our problem and we minimize God's greatness. We talk on and on about how big our problem is and we spend very little time on how great God is. 
We make God small by making our problems so big and insolvable. That's ridiculous. David had a way in enhancing God's greatness as much as possible in his mind. Look at Psalms 29 and 9. David says, the voice of the Lord spins and topples the mighty oak. It strips the forest bare. They whirl and swirl beneath the blast. But his temple, but in his temple, all are praising. Glory, glory to the Lord. Amen. This is what the Bible calls, you know, when we make our problem so big and God so small, it's what the Bible calls in the book of Numbers, the grasshopper syndrome. You remember when uh, Joshua and Caleb and, and, and ten others went into the land of uh, 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 Canaan. Moses had sent them in to spy the land out and they came back and Joshua and Caleb said, no problem, God promised to his house. Let's go take it. But the other ten said, uh-uh, there are giants over there in that land. We, we can't do, we got, we're nothing compared to them. We little squatty Hebrew people, and these are giants. And, and there's that key verse when it says, we seem to ourselves as grasshoppers, and so did we seem to them and in their eyes. Did you see what they did? They made their problem so big and their God so small. That's what we do. That's exactly what we do. You know, remember when you were kids and you got in an argument and you tried to top the other person? And one person would say something, the other person would say, double that. And the other person would say, you quadruple that. And then the other one would say, and plus one. You remember that? Yeah. Some of you are still doing it, right? But I, <laughs> I dare you to try to multiply and exaggerate the greatness of God. You cannot exaggerate the greatness of God. Amen? Amen? When you and I talk out aloud, take some time and tell God how big he is. You're not going to get a big head. Amen? God doesn't get prideful. And, and it does us some good in our lives to really talk out how great God is because it gives us a perspective that maybe this ain't as big. Let me tell you something. Have you ever, have you ever thought a problem was so big that it was going to swallow you up but once you tackled it, it wasn't as big as you thought it was. You know why? Because you tackled it. If you talk up how great God is, it'll help you tackle whatever that problem is in your life. Amen? Number four. Tell God what you want. Even if you're afraid that that's not God's will for you, tell him anyway. One or two things will happen. Either God will tell you, you're right. Go, go get it. Or God will say, this is not what I have for you. At least now you know. Some of us won't tell God what we want because we're afraid of what God is going to say to us and so we do this little kabuki dance around it and so we spend all this time wanting to do it but we don't know whether God wants us to do it or not because we hadn't really talked to God about it. Now, we've talked to you. We've talked to our 200 closest friends and they have the power of what? To get it done? If it's not God's will for you, God will tell you. And this is the great thing. If God tells you it's not God's will, it's because God's got something better for you. Amen? And so if you tell God the desires of your heart, then what you've done is you open your heart to God. And if you're going to love God with all your heart, you can't be holding anything back. A lot of times we don't love God with our whole heart and all out love for God is because we've not really communicated with God what we really want. And so God has, hadn't had a chance to tell you yes or no because you never told him what you want. 
God's not going to answer questions you don't ask. Hmm? Because God's not going to violate your will. But you ask. If it's not what God wants for you, God will let you know. And so, well, how, do, well, how will I know? Believe you me, you will know. Try it without God's permission. <laughs> and see what it looks like. Because we do that sometimes too, don't we? God says no, and we say, well, I don't really believe I heard from the Lord on that one. <laughs> because we wanted to do it. And we get in trouble, don't we? But this is the problem right here. We don't, it's not a problem. This is the good news. You can't go too far for God to, from God to reach, for God to reach you. God's always going to be. If you go down that road and get yourself in trouble, I, I'm not going to tell you, you don't, there won't be some consequences you have to pay for going down that wrong road, especially make a bad choice. But I can tell you this, God will still forgive you, God will still love you, God will still draw you back. That's called grace. That's called grace. Amen? And the only way to love God with all your heart is to bring him the greatest desires of your heart. It's crucial. David was in the habit of doing You can read it in almost every song uh, of him pouring his heart out to God, what he really wanted, even the bad stuff. And, and, and I'll tell you, you know, that verse where he says, strike them on the jaw and all this kind of stuff. He was mad. He wanted God to kill them off. Kill every one of them. You know that wasn't God's will. And so if you read on down to the end of that song, you see where his heart is changed. Amen? Amen? Because he talked it out to the Lord. Number five. This is one of the excellent reasons why most of us don't talk out loud to God. Fear. And, and this is the thing that you need to understand. Your fear always looks smaller when the light of God is shining on you. Things that look so big, like those giants, don't look so big if you look at them through the eyes of faith. When you understand that there is nothing greater than God, when you understand that great uh, line that, when you understand the answer to that great line that God asked Abraham, is there anything too hard for God? Then you understand there ain't anything that you, you, you may have been through some terrible things. Every one of us has been through terrible things, huh? Anybody in this room haven't had a terrible time in your life? Anybody in this room never had somebody turn on you? Anybody has never had somebody speak an ill word to you? Anybody has not had a, a difficult time financially at some point or not? We all have had bad times. And yet, when the light of Christ, when we speak it out, when we tell God about our fears, and the light of Christ shines on it, it don't look so big. Amen? Amen? So tell God about your fears. Tell him, here's what I'm afraid of. Look what David said in Psalms 25. Look at how many enemies I have. He has got some fears. Remember, not only was the, he was having to deal with the Philistines, and not only was he having to deal with a, the Assyrians, he's got to deal with folks in his own camp. His son, Absalom. Absalom. A-B-A-S-L-O-M. Whatever that word is. Amen? Look at how many, see how much they hate me. Look what he says, protect and save me, I trust you. Don't let me be disgraced. Does that sound like a man who is timid about what he's going to say to God? Amen? Tell God about the fears in your life. When you do, they have a way of getting small. Amen? Number six. Openly and emotionally. I love Psalms 38, 17, 18. I bet every one of us felt exactly the same way at some point in our lives. He says, listen to this. This is good. How constantly I find myself on the verge of sin. Did you get that? This source of sorrow always stirs me in the face. I confess my sin. I'm sorry for what I've done. I love that phrase, on the verge of sin. When you're on the verge 
of something, it feels like the smallest little thing will push you off. Have you ever felt like that? It's sort of like when you said, you're on my last nerve. <laughs> you're on the verge of sin when you say that. You're on my last nerve. <laughs> because if they push you one bit more, you're going to go off. And you're going to say something you ain't supposed to say. Uh, Bob has done it to me many a time. I found her on the verge of sin, and she sinned in the way she talked to me. What do you need to do, though, in a situation like that? You need to talk to God about it. I wish Papa would talk to God about that before she'd say something to me. Let me say, I'm just kidding. With God. You know, you can complain about it. You can say, God, this isn't fair. Where did you ever find that in the Bible? That's the dumbest thing I think Christians can say. This ain't fair. Whoever told you life was fair? You didn't find that in the Bible. Well, it's supposed to be, everybody's supposed to, please show me one place in the Bible where everybody was treated the same. It doesn't work that way. That's an American thing. That is not a biblical thing. I'm sorry. I know that some people, that's news to some people. Fairness is a it's not a biblical thing. Because you know why? Because none of us are alike. God treats us individually according to what we need. It's sort of like the mother who was asked, who had all these children, and was asked, do you love them all equally? And she said, no. I love the one sick under the well. I love the one that's hurt until they're whole. I love the one that's depressed until they smile again. You see, it ain't about being fair. It's, God doesn't give you fair. Everything God does is fair. But God doesn't do, give everybody the same thing. Because you don't, you don't need what I need. So if God gave you what God gave me, what good would that do you? God gives you what you need. doesn't give you everybody the same thing. He gives, there's only one thing, well, a few things, that God gives everybody equally. Love, forgiveness, and acceptance. Now we all get that equally. But how it's measured out to us is different because your, what you need forgiveness for is so much greater than what I need forgiveness for. <laughs> Judy, keep your comments to yourself. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> Okay? But he said, God, I confess the way I feel. I confess the strength that I need. Amen? Number seven. Do you know how to love God with your whole heart? Psalm 51, 17. David said in the midst of talking to God about the greatest sin in his life, it was Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 are, two of this, are the two psalms that David wrote in response to the Bathsheba incident. I don't know if you knew that. Um, those are the two psalms. Remember, he, it was, one, it was the, uh, the, the, the story in... And uh, first King, uh, Second Kings starts off with, you know, it was in the time of the year when kings go to battle, and and and, and uh, Joab, the general of the army, had told David, "No, you stay behind, lest the life." David was getting older at the time, and and J General Joab told him, "We will not let you go in battle anymore, lest the light of Israel be uh, cut out." They didn't want him to die in battle, and so in that time of the year when the kings go to battle, he stayed behind, and Joab took the front line and and fought for Israel. Uh, but he went walking on the rooftop of the palace. And he looked over and he saw this woman. Ooh, cutie. He asked, who is that? Someone told him, that's Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite's wife. Still knowing that this was a married woman he sent for, had sex with her, had an affair with her, she got pregnant. 
And then it went all, it's, he did, he sent for uh, Uriah to come home. He tried to deceive him and go to sleep with his wife so he could put the baby off of him. When Uriah wouldn't do that, he tried to get him drunk, thinking maybe if he gets drunk enough, he'll go sleep with his wife. He wouldn't do that. So then he had to come up with another plan. And so he concocted this plan. He wrote a note to jo, uh, Joab, General Joab, and sent it by Uriah. Is that audacity or what? And, uh, and, and, Joab, and, and Uriah didn't open and read it or anything. He just gave it to General Joab. And in the note it says, in the heat of the battle, put Uriah up front and withdraw from it that he might be struck down. And so Joab thought, ooh, this ain't good. But this is the king who ordered him to do it. And so he did, and Uriah died in battle. So then... He sent and got Bathsheba because she was pregnant and married her. Well, he thought everything was hid. But Nathan <laughs> came along and said, um, David, let me tell you a story. There was a man who had um, lots of sheep. And this other guy had one little sheep. And it was like a daughter to her. He, he loved it and all this stuff. And the man had many sheep. But then a traveler came and to prepare dinner, instead of taking one of his many sheep, he took the one man's little ewe lamb and killed it and used it for his own. And David was madder than a wet hen. He said, the person who did such a thing deserved to die. And Nathan said, David, you're the man. And Psalms 51 and Psalms 32 was written in response to that story. And in Psalms 51, David is feeling the weight of what he did. And by the 17th verse, he has worked through this thing. And he's, he realizes how good God really is that I have done all of this and God still forgives me. And so he wrote, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not ignore. He understood, even in the Old Testament, something about the grace of God that was greater than anything that any of the prophets in his day had ever told him about. And so he said it out loud. A contrite heart, O oh Lord, you will not ignore. He said what he knew to be true. The reason he could come out of all that he had said and all that he did, rather, was because he gave voice to the truth of God's forgiveness and God's grace. Some of you need to say out loud, I know I'm forgiven. I don't care what it is you've done. I know I'm forgiven. I know God's grace covers even me. It doesn't matter what I've done. God's grace covers me. Say out loud what you know to be true. God, you're faithful. And you're here. And you forgive me. I could shout right now. Amen? It reminds you of that truth. The last thing, what? Your crowd, your complaints, and troubles. Listen to this passage from Psalm 142. David expressed himself to God. I cried aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him my troubles. If you're going to love God with all your heart, you got to involve God in all of your life. You can't be hiding anything from him. Even your complaints, even your troubles, bring them. When we talk at the beginning of the service, when we say, bring whatever it is. Don't leave anything back so that God can cover it all. Amen? He can handle it. If you want to love God with your whole heart, you need to talk aloud to him with your emotions. 
You need to, there needs to come to a place in your life where you, 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 you say what you know is true and you say, I know I can make it. I know I can stand. No matter what comes my way, my life is in his hand. Speak it. Give voice to it. The only way you'll ever break the cycle of secrecy over whatever it is in your life. That's what balm is about, isn't it? Breaking that secret and the power that hurts you. There is a balm in Gilead. Amen? I know I can make it. I know I can stand. My life is in. Let's stand and sing. God, I pray tonight that these, your people, will give voice to whatever it is they need to say to you, whether it's a burden, whether it's a fear, whether it's a hope, whether it's a desire, that they will give voice to it and hear and hear from you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.